Once upon a time, when it was a few friends and I in the English department, this reading series was called Our Favorite Writers. When we moved it here, we changed that name because we didn't want to presume the taste of a whole great institution. But that old claim could never have been more accurate than tonight when I have the pleasure of introducing one of my own true favorite writers, Norman Rush. I'm not alone. In a poll a few years ago by the New York Times Book Review, writers, and this is unusual for writers to be voting, but writers voted on the most important American novels of the past 25 years. Mating was among those chosen, and the votes all came from novelists under 40. Among my generation, Jeff Eugenides, Michelle Hunovan, Lori Moore, Jonathan Franzen and I are among the writers who say they've been influenced, which often means one wishes one were more influenced, by Norman Rush. Some of you here tonight are ardent fans of Norman Rush's three published books. Others of you perhaps have only heard of him. Others maybe have been dragged by a friend or a spouse or a teacher. Why is Norman Rush a writer's writer more than a household name? I'll tell you why, and it's a very simple reason. See these books? It's because unlike his contemporaries and equals, Philip Roth and Alice Munro, whom I consider the greats, Rush has published three books with years in between. Our most significant critic, James Wood, says of Rush's books that they're like eclipses. They arrive rarely, but tend to impose themselves massively. Mr. Wood was referring to their aesthetic weight, but in fact, the two novels come in at 477 pages and 712 pages. He's not less prolific than his contemporaries, but he's capable, as few are in our constellation, of creating a novelistic whole the Victorians or the Russians would recognize and love. Rush was born in San Francisco in 1933 to an aspiring opera singer and a socialist trade union organizer. He was named in part after Norman Thomas, the Socialist Party's recurrent candidate for president. An opera singer and a socialist, think of the possibilities in that combination, and you begin to understand the Russian vantage. Rush went to prison as a conscientious objector to the Korean War. After graduating Swarthmore, he worked as an antiquarian book dealer to support his family. From 1978 to 1983, that's five years, he and his wife Elsa were co-directors of the Peace Corps in Botswana, and those five years deeply fed his fictional world. He published his first book in 1986, Whites, a collection of short stories, when he was 53. When Joshua Pashman, in interviewing Rush for the Paris Review, asked why he'd published his first book at 53, he said, what were you writing before? This was Rush's answer. It depends on when you want to start. You probably don't want to start with the comic book series, Mac of Mars, circa 1945, or my faux Father Brown detective stories featuring Dr. Orion Kurm, circa 1947. My brother printed a manifesto of mine, Papers Against the State, on a hand press when I was 17. I wrote a novel at 18 when I was in prison. At Swarthmore, I published some gnomic poems based on little known events in the tragic history of the democratic left. I wrote another novel, never published. James Joyce was a wondrous and calamitous influence on me. Interspersed along the way, having a family, running a book business, too much reading and drinking, and too much perfectionism. White's, the first collection of short stories, was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize. Nonetheless, readers had to wait five years to read Mating, Rush's first novel, which won the National Book Award. Ten years after that, Mortals was published. Mortals is a deeply serious, deeply ambitious, deeply successful book, James Wood wrote. For once, knowledge in an American novel has not come free and flameless from Google, but has come out of the writer's own burning. For once, knowledge is not simply exotic and informational, but something amassed as life is amassed, as a pile of experiences, rather than a wad of facts. Botswana is never a backdrop, but always a fabric of Russia's fictions. 
and he clearly knows and loves the country. And for once, intelligence is not mere smartness, but an element inseparable from the texture and movement of the novel itself. For once, it is novelistic intelligence, for which we should give thanks. Another critic says, his two novels are instantly canonical and somehow defy category. The depth and richness of ex experience in his mastery at reducing it to the page gives his books their own force and gravity. It's an oddly Victorian enterprise, one thinks of Darwin, a naturalist returning from exotic places with a trove of insights to pour into books over a period of decades. He's the essential novelist, among other things, of globalization. One wants to call him the best writer of his generation, but one imagines that Rush would reject the category. As with any great novel, one wonders how the seamless conjuring, the amazing precision and playfulness of the voice, the flashing river of thoughts and insights and formulations and feelings was accomplished. Our mutual editor, Anne Close, says, it has been one of the great pleasures of her life to work with Norman Rush ever since he gave her the first half of mating to read, and then left her stranded in the middle of the desert, waiting for three years to get the second half. She says she can't wait to receive the final version of the new book. Rush has always been deeply obsessed with love. He said his first novel, Mating, was about courtship. His second novel, Mortals, was about marriage, and his third, about friendship. This came from a piece in this week's um, Los Angeles Review of Books written by Magdalena Edwards, who's here tonight. I doubt that this is true. I doubt that, mar I doubt that he's written about friendship. I bet that this book is about marriage and friendship. For 49 years, Norman Rush and his wife Elsa have lived in a farmhouse on New York's High Tor Mountain, where he's written all his books in a one-room attic according to the Paris Review interview, amid clusters of treasures and junk. Here's Norman Rush. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. Appreciate it very much. And thanks to Mona and the people she works with for <clears throat> arranging this. I have a prefatory note that I want to make uh, before I begin. <clears throat> One way to look at literature is as the art of complaint, its object being to make complaint beautiful, memorable, and enlightening. I think that this art reaches its highest realization in the novel. But maybe that's just me. That's what I write. The characters in novels always have something to complain about, to fix or undo or to heal. So, so far, nothing new. Novelists find matter for, for complaint at all levels of the human condition, domestic, dynastic, at the levels of race, class, and gender. And this discourse of complaint can contribute, sometimes spectacularly, to the healing of the world. Uncle Tom's Cabin, in addition to supercharging the abolitionist cause in the US, when it was translated into Russian, was also significant in the prohibition of serfdom there, years later. So literature not only does occasional tangible good, but it also works more generally and subtly against the deepest causes of war, injustice, cruelty, and all the infinite varieties of violence. But in times of broad crisis, and I think we are in such a time now, writers have to wonder how relevant, hate the word, their fine discriminations are, since even the best novels operate through the science of distraction and are burdened by an appetite among readers for happy endings. As I said, I think we are undergoing something like a foundational crisis, economic, political, environmental. Parenthetically, since the beginning of austerity in, in Greece, the suicide rate has risen by 40%. At moments like this, the career of writing feels morally fragile. That's all I want to say. I, I said it mostly for myself, I guess. In any case, I hope you like my book. 
which is about, among other things, friendship. And I hope we all su uh, survive this storm coming from the depths of time. My book is called Subtle Bodies. An enraged woman, Nina, pursues her husband, Ned, across the continent to a reunion two decades after uh, graduation with four of his close friends from college. She is ovulating. She has taken the last of the month's clomids. She is bitterly determined to keep to the impregnation regimen she and Ned, he is 48, she is 37, are following, and which Ned has jeopardized by his abrupt departure. It is fall 2002, and she is further maddened by the messages deluging her from members of the Bay Area convergence against the invasion of Iraq, a coalition Ned has organized for the purpose of staging a monster peace march. The occasion of the reunion is the sudden accidental death of Doug Delmartyr, the founder of Ned's informal circle of absolute friends, a man famous for his exposure of two notorious forgeries. One, a set of documents reaccusing Alfred Dreyfus of treason, and the other, the sex diaries of Mylon Kundera, <laughs> which Doug showed to be a vile fabrication by the Russian secret services. Doug has left behind a castle in the Catskills and a widow, Iva, 40, a certified great beauty and the former premier gossip columnist in Czech media. There is a bizarrely wayward 14-year-old son. Iva has summoned the four friends to support her in this emergency. Nina is hostile to this group of friends, an assortment of characters formerly engaged in worthless intellectual acting out under the influence of Doug, as she sees it. They have under, undervalued her Ned. No friend is what he was. The four have been tasked by Iva with, tasked by Iva with creating some kind of memorial spectacle, apparently. Doug's widow, in her beautiful distress, awakens sexual tensions and competition among all the friends, except Ned. Into this setting, Nina arrives. Nina, <clears throat> riding in furious pursuit, felt like bucking in her seat to make the plane go faster through the night. She was still enraged. She felt like a baby. She thought, you are a baby. No, he is, he is, he is my lamb. Maybe the matronly, pleasant-seeming woman sitting next to her was wise. She was old enough to be. Anything was possible. And it might not hurt to talk to an adult other than my incessant mother, she thought. She had to call her mother when they landed, first thing. It just, it's just that she won't shut up about my pregnancy, she thought. Her attempted pregnancy was what she meant. She shouldn't have told her about it. I love my mother, she wanted to tell the woman next to her. It was just that her mother was overflowing with pregnancy lore that had nothing to do with reality. She'd been unkind when her mother said, trying to be helpful, you smell differently when you're pregnant. Because she'd said, oh really, how do you, smoke nuts? How do you smell then, with your uterus? All her mother had been trying to say was that there was a change in the odor a woman's body gives off during pregnancy. But then her mother also maintained that there was a mystical, subtle, second body surrounding every human being and that if you could if you could see it it told you something her mother claimed she could see the human aura a little and not all the time dinner as they called it was done with she seemed to have twisted her napkin into a rope and she wondered if her seatmate had noticed the woman wasn't being especially friendly to her usually the people she happened to sit next to were Yes, she was enraged at Ned, but also felt sorry for him. May God help you, my lad, my Ned, she thought. He would be dumbfounded when he realized she had sprung after him, done it like that, 
like a savage beast dropping everything herself, the same as he had, like a child, an adolescent, a child. He had never seen her truly furious, never, once, never once in five years of marriage. He had seen her agitated and he had seen her annoyed, but he had never seen this. I am war, she thought. No question he deserved tenderness, which he got. On her own, she had quit referring to his beloved clique of college friends as clowns. <laughs> he hadn't asked her to, but the term had pinched a little, and this despite the fact that they had been clowns monquet, a troop goofing on the world under the baton of Doug, their master, their maestro. She had to control herself. She needed to be calm and alkaline. She thought, I wonder if he thinks I love standing on my head after sex, <laughs> him holding my feet in the air. He had left her a barely readable note. Twice since leaving, he'd called her, and each time she'd answered, I am not answering this phone. <laughs> everything had been left for her to deal with. Not only everything to do with the nonprofits, but and not only the missent invoices and the complaints about the metallic taste of the coffee they were getting from their co-ops in Belize, but calls about the demonstration he was organizing, the same calls over and over again, because this was a coalition. She hated coalitions. And why did Ned have to be the chair? She made an involuntary flinging out gesture, gesture that startled her seatmates, who flinched. Nina tried to bury the gesture, gesture in a show of policing her tray, what, tray table, which she doubted that the woman was deceived. Ned could be annoying without meaning to. Talking about preg getting pregnant, he had said, about his own attitude, attitude to it, I can't decide whether I'm ambivalent or not. <laughs> which which was a ghastly survival, a ghostly survival of the talky, badinage-based humor of his circle of friends. It was a slightly funny thing to say, but the subject wasn't funny. Nina had the window seat. She, wind she raised the window shade to study the night. Why did stadiums where no one was at play have to be lit up like Christmas? Why? But why everything? Really, and why had that woman writing her up in the Contra Costa Times described her as sharp-featured? Why? Because she wasn't. And why hadn't she mentioned in the story that Nina had gotten an award saying that she was the best accountant the nonprofits in the Bay Area had ever heard of? She considered her reflection in the window. Why not angular instead of sharp-featured? Well, she was going to take the bull by the horns and talk to her co-passenger. It was ordained that the woman's wallet was going to be jammed with snapshots of unblemished grandchildren. <laughs> she would deal with it. She needed to talk. She needed to be with Ned now, before the 36 hours were up so they could do it. Had he forgotten or did he just not care? No, it was because he was ambivalent about fatherhood and family making. He felt old for it. He was 48. The woman beside her opened her purse and extracted a paperback, which she seemed to be handling almost reverently, like a missile. Nina was curious. The woman moved unsubtly away, taking her arm off the common armrest. Nina entertained the idea that the woman had sensed a core truth about her, which was that she always wanted to know exactly what people were reading. I can't help it, she thought. She always wanted to know. It had been embarrassing from time to time when people saw her craning around inappropriately to get a clue about what, about what they were reading. It was just that it made her feel better to know. Somebody could be reading Mein Kampf. And she didn't like people who covered the books they were reading in little homemade craft paper jackets. <laughs> she couldn't help taking that as a challenge, apparently. Definitely the woman was tense now. But she might as well re relax because Ulrida Already, Nina knew what she was reading. She had figured it out in a glance. But I'm clumsy, she thought. She thought it again. Then she passed her hands down her sides. She didn't know why. The woman had bent the front cover of the paperback around to conceal the spine. And she was slanting the book so that Nina would be required to contort herself to make out what was on the page. 
Her dual task seemed to be to read and at the same time keep what she was reading secret from Nina. It was silly because this cover art featuring embossed foil bolts of lightning and a cross on a blood red field signaled that the book was an entry in the genre of Christian theological thrillers that had gotten so popular. That was the last thing she needed to think about, the end of the world. Well, she wouldn't interrupt this person when she was reading because reading was sacred. It was to my mother, she thought, the number of times her mother had found her reading intently when it was time to set the table and given her a pass was legion. She wouldn't mind getting into an argument on Christianity because she had a new standpoint on the subject since she had happened to marry a sort of Jesus, a secular Jesus, of course, not that he would ever tolerate that description. So far as she know, knew, he had never done a bad thing, except for like a complete asshole, abandoning her to go to the funeral of fucking Doug, the world's greatest friend, going and just leaving her a few messages. Nina had her own reading matter, but she was too hyper to read. Two poems in Poetry Magazine had irritated her. In one poem, the sentiment was that the reader gets to the seaside and it's the sea shouting help. The sea saying help to humans, something like that. And then in another one, the poet seemed to say, it's closing time in the old fort and you have to go and you can't find your sons. So what to do? You just go back to the cannons and you'll find them hanging around there. Everything was upsetting. And there was nothing interesting about the interior of a plane. Her seatmate swallowed a cough. Planes were unsanitary. She was breathing recirculated air and it was Ned, his impulsiveness. Ned, who was to blame, her fury was rising again. She knew why it was. Things she wanted, things she thought she had, being jerked away from her without warning and at the last minute triggered massive feelings in her based on patterns in her absurd childhood, patterns she had studied and parsed and studied until she was sick of the subject. But her therapist had been a Freudian and being sick and tired of it was never a reason for letting go of something. The reverse! <laughs> and after nine years of staring into the facts, she had no ideals, idea still how she should feel about her pixie parents. Up, down, sad, send them to the firing squad. How should she feel about the elf shoes with their pointy toes curving back toward her little shins that her mother had gotten on sale, sale making her wear them to school, insisting that they were perfectly normal? <laughs> she remembered the giant celebrations were held when her father finally got into the Screen Extras Guild in his 50s. <laughs> Was that sane? She had no idea. They did this, they did that. For anything else, they or for, for, for anything she got, they medicated her with bark tea. Her mother had become an astrologer because it was such a portable occupation, but then they had stayed stuck in Los Angeles forever. Linda, her mother's best friend and worst influence, had branched out into astrology for pets, <laughs> dogs mainly, and tried to get her mother to take it up, which she hadn't. She still had some decency. But then, finally, Late in the day, turning 34, she had found Ned and gotten him to want a child and to really try with her. And then this. She thought, I take the pills, I get the shot, he vanishes. It was outrageous. It was Le Grand Doug. Doug had been the head of Ned's clique at NYU in the 70s, the spokes model, when they were undergraduates, which would make it Doug's clique, logically. They had been a group of wits, of superior sensibilities or alternate sensibilities of some kind was the idea. Everything she'd been told about Doug was irritating. He even had his own term for the condition they were trying to propagate, perplexion. So elegant. And there was his legendary pensiveness, how he would sometimes hold up his hand in a certain way to signal the group to stop talking so he could finish a thought he wasn't sharing. Then he might jot something down on a scrap of paper, or he might not. 
The point to her seemed to be to show that whatever was going on around him was subordinate to the great private productive secret, not necessarily related to anything his groundling friends were talking about, trains of thought, the grand Doug was always having. And mainly what she knew about Doug was that he'd been the ringmaster of the group at NYU. He had demonstrated that he was the world's champion of walking out of movies at the Thalia, walking out on foreign films. <laughs> walking out on foreign films, he found subpar and taking his pack of stupid fool friends along with him. She had been incredulous hearing about that and about Ned obeying Doug, essentially. And Ned had told her about the group going to see Last Tango in Paris. And Maria Schneider and Marlon Brando were having precoital fooling around, and in the course of it, she was, had to, has to pee, and she goes into the toilet in the vacant apartment they're carousing in, and the camera follows her in, and she pees, but gets up without wiping or using a bidet or anything, and they, then they had gone on to have sex. So, quelle horreur! And that was enough for Doug, who found the hygienic omission a good enough excuse to lead his minions out immediately. His position had been that the omission fatally attacked the plausibility of the scene. They had been very severe about cine cinema, Ned's group. It was amazing to her. They had walked out on Brando at his professional and physical peak. So why did they keep going to the Thalia and led by someone who was so sensitive that the odds were that their money would be spent for nothing? And what she did know with certainty was that Ned had been abandoned gradually, and then finally, by this man, he was racing ahead of her to praise and bury. And it had been painful, muted but painful, to Ned over the years. And the abandonment had obviously gotten more painful to Ned and Doug. As Doug got half famous in the world, debunking forgeries, she had no idea what had led Doug into the question documents business, but something had. And he'd proved that some papers showing Alfred Dreyfus was in fact guilty were right-wing forgeries. And so then someone had forged Mylon Kundera's so-called love diaries and Doug, Doug had shot them down. And then Doug had married the leading gossip columnist in Czechoslovakia, the radiant Iva, a consensus great beauty. And he had gotten her over to the US and put her in a tower in the woods in the Catskills near Woodstock and they had lived there, and there had been an inheritance. And when the internet came, there could be, would be little fragments from Doug to Ned, avant-garde tips on nutrition, or postings from the Committee for Ethical Tourism, which proved there was nowhere in the world you could go for a vacation except possibly Canada. <laughs> she had always wanly hoped to get revenge on Doug, because there had truly been a superior soul in their little grouplet, and that had been her lad, her Ned. And now she remembered another thing that had driven her crazy about Doug. At first, uh, through the mail, then by fax, and then by email, had come a stream, a very intermittent stream, of short papers and notes from Doug, who had become eccentric and was proposing various universal solutions to the problem of the persistence of evil in the world, in human relations. And some of them had been like monotheism, items like monotheism. Then it was declining terrestrial magnetism. And there had been others. There was his theory that gradual anoxia was driving mankind crazy based on the shrinking percentage of oxygen in the atmosphere compared to the much higher oxygen content in samples taken from bubbles in ancient Egyptian glassware. And then it had been estrogens and antidepressants infiltrating the water supply. It would be nice if somebody could ever prove that unkindness was caused by pollution. And Ned had always been dutiful and sent some sort of reply, trying to argue. Shorter and shorter replies because Doug almost never, and then never, had had anything to say to Ned in return. No expansion on the subject. Doug's group had thought very highly of itself. They were going to be social renovators of some unclear kind had been the idea by somehow generalizing their friendship. Ned would still get solemn talking about those times. She didn't get it. And part of the original group idea had been that 
they would always be a unity, helping each other, maybe creating a compound in the wildwood for summer vacations, or maybe crafting some excellent retirement collective. Right, she thought. One thing she knew, and Ned did not, was that there is no permanent friendship between men, among men. Something goes wrong, somebody marries the wrong person, somebody advances too fast, somebody refuses good advice or bad advice, it didn't matter. It went up in a flash, like magnesium paper set on fire in a magic show. She thought, it's not always great with women either, but it can be. Women can have friends. It's more personal, she thought, although in the great design of things, women were getting to be more like men. There were more tough cookies around and liars. Well, Ned was her friend, her deep friend. He didn't realize it exactly. He thought everything was love with them, but it wasn't. She would have been his friend whenever. It was a standard fantasy when you fell in love to imagine you could go back in time and find your beloved growing up, appear there, save him or her, get together as adolescents by magic and go on together, fighting for each other into old age, never wavering. It was a friendship fantasy. And that was why she was enraged at the man, enraged. She had to get this rage out of her so she could kill him when he, they got together. He was an idiot. He was reckless. He was wrecking everything. He was hopeless. He had shit for brains. He couldn't be counted on. He was a fool. These people had hurt him in the past, and not only Doug. She knew very little about that, but knew it was true. These cocksuckers would have to get out of her way. She was moving around too much in her seat. The woman next to her was unhappy. She offered the woman her uneaten dessert, a brownie still in its packaging. Nina had watched her devour her own brownie in two bites earlier. No, said the woman, quite forcefully. She thinks I'm affiliated with Satan, <laughs> Nina thought. <laughs> Nina thought. Now, the, the novel is told in two voices. That's obviously Nina. And this is Ned, uh, who is... Um, just arrived, got on the ground, just is arriving, walking up to the estate of his, um, the deceased Douglas. His great friend was dead. He wanted to embrace his dead friend. An imaginary burning feeling ran across Ned's chest and down his arms. He wanted to embrace his friend. Where Doug's body was, even, none didn't know. No clue whether it had been removed from the estate, no clue what shape it might be in wherever it was. Nobody could have gotten there from the West Coast any faster than he had, and still he was too late. Except that when the fall, the call had finally come from you, from Hugh, it had already been too late, whatever he meant by that. He meant something. Your thinking is choppy he thought. Doug had died when his riding mower pitched him down into a ravine, with the mower on top of him when the ground at the edge gave way. Earth had covered him, so he had been buried once already. These were the Catskills all around. The upward road he was walking on ran through the terrain, a terrain jammed with trees still dripping from a huge rainstorm he had just missed. It was trees, trees and glimpses of hills farther off, also burdened with trees, as Doug might have put it. The ruts in the unpaved road were like established brooks. It was all uphill. There were regular trees in their last leaf, intermixed with unwelcome, bristling evergreens. It was four in the afternoon. This was not where he would choose to die, in a ditch in this vicinity. What had Doug seen? Dying, his neck broken and mud sliding over him. No friend near, no one around, mud engulfing him. 
Ned shrugged off his rucksack and, holding it against his chest to give his shoulders a break, continued on. He had brought too much reading matter and so far only managed to get through the three most recent issues of The Economist. That had been during the San Francisco to Houston leg of the trip before depression and guilt had shut him down. He was depressed about the war that was coming and guilty that he had abandoned the little he was doing in the effort to stop it. There was going to be a march. There was a coalition. It was funny, the, the anarchists were the easiest to deal with and the Quakers were the most difficult. <laughs> he would do what he could by phone. Oh, and he felt guilty about leaving Nina with so little warming, warning. And when the timing on their personal project was so critical. So at this point he stops, feels a resistance to going on to his destination and decides to turn around and go back down to a store that he has passed on the way up. This was a store Doug must have frequented for years. The Vale, it was called. It was clearly from the 1920s or so, a shrine to the period in, it, in its way. The signage said they sold sundries along with bait, lotto, news, coffee, and adult. The Vale was a collation of dis disparate buildings populating a flat, boggy strip of land fronting the highway. Going up, Ned had skirted the store. If he'd known he was going to come back down, he could have packed, parked his rucksack there. He liked his Swiss Army issue backpack. He liked carrying the backpack of an army that had never fought a war. The enjoyment of that fact was enough to outweigh its unwieldiness. The Vale's centerpiece was the general, was the general store, a barn-like log structure set on, on an unusually high stone foundation with verandas along the sides and a front porch with wildly miscellaneous choices of seating, from bar stools and piano stools to a porch glider and car seats. A cinder blocks annex housed a propane sales and service operation. Next to that came a decommissioned sky blue double wide trailer connected to the annex by an improvised tunnel formed by stretching plastic sheeting over a succession of metal arches. Strings of ancient faded blue and yellow grand opening pennants encircled the three buildings at the roof line, drawing the elements of the veil together. Western music and occasional indications of hilarity leaked from the trailer. Ned set foot on the broken lattice of planks and duckboard that had been laid out in the mud in front of the store entrance. Splendid single lodgepole pines stood at the four corners of the store. He had observed coming down the mountain that the personal hinterland of the Vale was essentially a dump site for derelict machinery and other ejecta. There were cairns of hubcaps, short columns of discarded tires, piles of scrap lumber, huge bins wreathed in vines. Ned mounted the steps and stepped into a fluorescent blaze. He felt at first that he was alone in all the light and music of the cavernous establishment. Nina called fluorescent lighting, lighting for robots. Music from a ballroom dancing exhibition showing on a TV set fixed in a high angle of the room contended with pop music from somewhere. A police scanner interjected occasionally. The pop music was, he saw, due to a radio on the checkout counter behind which someone was sitting and watching. Ned had missed his, him because he was half hidden by the monumental antediluvian cash register. He was not a large man and he was seated in a wheelchair. The place was packed with things. Shelving rose almost to the ceiling. The aisles were narrow. Overhead, a web of clothesline had been strung to which articles like swim fins, butterfly nets, snorkel tubes, packs of sparklers, and saw blades had been clipped. An umbrella stand held a collection of grip sticks to be used for securing items from the web or the top shelves. 
A sign on the container in urgent printing warned that these devices would be used, should be used only with the help of staff and that any injury, damage, or product breakage resulting from unsupervised use would be the sole responsibility of the customer. There seemed to be no organizing principle. A display case contained fantasy knives and stuffed animals. A rotatable cylindrical rack bore condoms, sunglasses, shrink-wrapped jerky, and pink cap guns. He had to conquer his distraction. He needed to be a customer if he was going to use the toilet. A glance had told him that all the papers left were local, but he needed something, visine and a pocket comb. He approached the cashier, a delicate old man, handsome, with perfect silver hair, someone who could be a spokesman for dignified old age, except, of course, he was in a wheelchair. On closer inspection, he seemed to be a mouth breather. Tacked to the wall behind the old man was a POW MIA flag showing a GI prisoner in silhouette hunched over in dejection. Ned took off his rucksack and set it down where the old man could see it to relax him. Hello, he said, suppressing an impulse to extend his hand to this person who was so neatly gotten up. He was wearing a starched dress shirt buttoned to the neck, a red cardigan without a spot on it, and he gave off a pleasant aftershave scent. Ned knew what he, the man reminded him of. He was the patrician Dutchman, the old burgomaster, or even count, who stands up to the Nazis in a movie written by Lillian Hellman. <laughs> Ned said, I wonder if you have visine, eye drops, and a pocket comb. Of course, the old man said. So, not the patrician then, not the count, Ned thought. Ned was being directed to the bottom shelf where the visine should be. It was the end shelf in the row directly opposite the cashier. Ned understood that there would be another place to look if the visine failed to be there. The visine, he found, was actually murine. The shoulders of the tiny bottle were coated with grime. It would do. He paid for it. Something else he needed, oh yes, the comb. Paying for his purchases, Ned understood something correctly that he'd misinterpreted. Uh, Ned established that the Times uh, came most, de most days early, early afternoon, and that the old man would have a, a copy for him when it came. Ned sensed a little coldness now coming toward him. <clears throat> By asking for the Times, he had obviously identified himself as a beloved liberal. This man was concerned with the victims of war, and now there was going to be another one. There would be more MIAs, Ned was tempted to say something pointless. A large, soft, mouse-colored old dog, a Labrador, came out from behind the counter and stared at him. Could I use your restroom, Ned asked. Of course, said the old man, gesturing unclearly to his right. Ned worked it out. The restroom required a key, which was hanging on a hook at the end of the front counter. Ned reached for the key without realizing that the fine chain running through the hoop of the key also ran down through two tire hubs. So there was a certain clangor, of course. Ostensibly, this arrangement would be to keep the key from being lost or mislaid. But probably, it was also for merriment, especially when the uninitiated grabbed for the key without paying that much attention, as he had just done. The restroom was straight back and to the left, past the end of a vast display of periodicals, taking up all the space between the counter and the rear wall. He scanned the collection, selection as he passed. Pornorama, he thought. There was everything a man could want. <laughs> Naughty neighbors through gent, through plumpers, through a startling one, horientals, Breasts for all. Back near the counter, the main newsweeklies had formed a thin right-hand margin to the field, this field of pink plenty. And there, the weekly standard predominated with the last three issues preserved for sale, whereas only the current issue of Time and Newsweek were available. Interestingly, 
A shower curtain covered the last quarter of the array of porn. It would, could be slid aside. The de design on the curtain represented the world in the blue, through the blue translucencies between the continents, images of handsome male heads and bodies were discernible. Interesting as all this was, Ned couldn't linger. There was yet another party in the room observing him. A bald, youngish man, very heavy, was seated behind a workbench in a slot pushed into the middle of the back wall. He was repairing a fly rod. As he slumped back in his chair to notice Ned more comfortably, and as his chin sank into his fat throat, his dense, short-cropped yellow beard presented as a sort of Elizabethan ruff along the bottom of his face. Ned thought he had an intelligent look. His arms were lavishly tattooed. He wondered if this could be the fine old man's son. He hoped not. Back here all day, probably expected to keep an eye on porn browsers in case they were tempted to take something or whisk something with them into the toilet. That could be a problem. Not much of a life for this fellow. On the restroom door was a primitive cartoon of a figure that was female on one side, half a skirt, and male on the other, half a top hat. In the restroom, Ned was quick about everything. Rinsed his face with cold water, which was all there was. He decided he looked okay. He returned to the counter. Uh, where am I now? Oh, yeah. Paying for his last purchases, Ned understood something cor correctly that he'd misunderstood, misinterpreted. There were two black streamers hanging down, one, or, one on either side of the MIA flag. Ned had perceived them as something like crepe, something to emphasize the message of the thing. But in fact, they were ribbons of buck tape, black with dead flies. Buck tape was also a countertop impulse item. He took his change. The pocket comb that had appeared on the counter in his absence was naked. He wondered if the shopkeeper had procured it from his own pocket. <laughs> Thank you. As a writer in America, most of them are unreliable prizes and so forth, although Norman has won those too. But I consider the most reliable measure, I suppose, of canonization to be an interview in the Paris Review. And Norman had one recently. And for the first time ever, the interviewer decided to include, and, and it's a Q&A interview, it's a very famous form, they're, they're published later in books called Writers at Work. For the first time ever in the history of the Paris Review, um, the editors and the interviewer decided to include a partner, and Elsa is also gives answers in the interview, so I decided we couldn't do any differently. Um, by way of introducing Elsa, I just want to say, I'm just taking this from the Paris Review, that any account of Russia's working life should acknowledge Elsa's role or roles. She's his most significant editor and character model, as well as his daily muse and companion. She was born Elsa Scheidt to an FBI agent whose career took his family from North Carolina to New York City, but did not prevent him from blessing her marriage to the professed radical she had met at Swarthmore. Along with her Peace Corps directorship, she has worked as a hand weaver, designer, and teacher of design, and as the director of a program for dependent and neglected children. I wanted to start by saying, um, recently in, in, a, in a British newspaper, there was a series of, of sort of writer's tips to younger writers. 
um, various British writers talked about what time they got up in the morning, whether they used typewriters or computers, where they left off writing, whether characterization started a novel or plot. And then we had Richard Ford, an American novelist, who said, um, if you want to, his tips for a young writer were, marry someone who thinks that your being a writer is a good idea. <laughs> and I wanted to start by asking Elsa if you have always thought that Norman being a writer was a good idea. Well, I thought it was a good idea before I'd ever read anything he, he'd written. Uh, but then I, this is very romantic and it's true and I would be very distressed if a child or grandchild or child of a friend of mine did what I did, but I met Norman, uh, talked with him in a certain circumstance in a parlor at Swarthmore, and I went back to my dormitory and I said, I just met the man I want to spend the rest of my life with. And they said, oh, who? I said, I forgot to ask his name. <laughs> <laughs> so. It probably had less to do with his being a writer than it just did with some peculiar affinity which by m some miraculous chance turned out to be a smart part of my unconscious mind instead of a very stupid, childish thing to do. But don't leave out that you would, you, once I had seized on writing, and once you realized that I had been seized by writing, you were uh, my angelic muse, <laughs> defender, um, and uh, you believed in everything I did, even when I went through a period of very painful experimental writing. And I uh, won't go into the details of that, but, uh, <laughs> but I, I will say as a word of advice, not a good idea to set out with the idea that you can surmount what Joyce has done. <laughs> anyway, I, and I, there was a period as a poet too, so, but she was always, always the, uh, the deepest, uh, deepest friend and champion of my work. I thought it would be interesting to read the dedications of, of Norman's three books thus far. All three are dedicated to Elsa. White's, his first early collection, was dedicated for Elsa, beautiful and good, perfect friend with gratitude. Mating, his first novel, is dedicated, everything I write is for Elsa, but especially this book, since in it, her heart, sensibility, and intellect are so signally, if perforce esoterically, celebrated and exploited. My debt to her in art and in life grows, however much I put against it. The dedication to mortals is for my muse, for my muse and critic with gratitude for the last 10 years of extraordinary forbearance, creative impatience, unfailing love. Elsa, you are unique. <laughs> Do you ever fight? Do you ever fight over the work? I mean, I know you edit Norman's work. You, you're his first reader. You're his most central and important reader. Do you, does the story or the characters ever go in a direction where you say, no, this isn't right? Yes. And how, how are things around the house during those periods of time? Well, I know I have no authority, so I'm... Uh, Is that true? She has no authority? Uh, well, I have no authority. I make suggestions, but there, I make good ones. There, there, are, time, <laughs> there, are, times when, there are times when we come, come head to head, and that, that is, that's difficult. Uh, and I will say that um, mating was w taking so long that she threatened to move out and <laughs> go and live in the Mohonk Mountain House, which is a very pricey, wonderful place, but very pricey. So that did speed me up. Uh, her basic complaint is about the, the, the speed and the, with which I, I produce my... I sort of 
osmose them, I sort of extrude them rather than writing, writing them. And, and that, of course, is very difficult for a wife to live with. But she is good. I actually think uh, that a true thing about Norman's writing and my, my reaction, my negative reaction sometimes, when I say things like, this is insane, is not about his writing. It's about a relationship he has to it. And I, I don't think I've ever read about this, but we all know that many things are addictive. Many substances, substances are addictive and activities are addictive. And I think Norman's characters are, are addictive entities or the sensation he has in creating them it, it, it creates chemicals that are, he's, to which he's addicted. And I think it's a real thing. I don't know where to go with it, but I really do think that sometimes I feel that he takes a long time because he, he comes downstairs after writing and I look at him and I think, he, he loves this. He loves them. He'll never stop. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we do have, we don't have mean fights about it, but I will say things like, I really think you don't want to let it go, or it, it isn't reasonable to say you're going to write a book in two years and it's going to be 180 pages and then write 700 pages and then cut it down to 300 pages and then write 200 pages more and then cut it down to 100. Just well, you, the, the, that sort of thing. I, I don't yell it. Enough. I just say I don't think it's reasonable. So the answer is yes. Ask another question. <laughs> <laughs> yes. We do butt heads, but we don't fight Now, you've about now had it. three books, three novels together, um, and uh, one collection of short stories, but you've just, you're just about, you've just completed the third novel that you read from tonight. Yes. Has the process changed over these three books, and can you describe how it's changed? Have you two worked more together on this book, less together in different ways? How has how is the well, collaboration once we, changed? Once we get to the editing stage, it, everything is, is fine. <laughs> pretty much, wouldn't you say? <laughs> pretty, pretty, pretty much fine. Tell the truth about what it was like at the beginning. No, I'm not telling. I'm not telling anything about that. <laughs> this is two against one. <laughs> you know, in so many ways, the writer's life is so isolated. It's a dream to have this kind of collaboration. It, he came to feel that. <laughs> he came to feel that. Yeah. <laughs> It, there, it, there was a long period of time when I, I did feel, uh, actually, um, Josh Pashman, who did the Paris Review interview, talked about this, and I don't know if it ended up that interview was 500 pages long, and I think it was a few pages in Paris Review. So. It was quite a few pages, but uh, yeah. it was definitely a little down from yeah. yeah, so I don't know what, what was there and what was just said, but, but it... Uh, it it, it is the case that in the beginning, Norman, uh, I had no self-confidence, but I... As an editor. As, uh, no, it isn't that I didn't have self-confidence. I felt that I knew that I was right about certain things, but that I had no right to be right about them in, a, in any forceful way. And I could make suggestions. That certainly and, changed. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Change. And I, I would a make terrible, suggestions. A terrible beauty is born. <laughs> changed utterly. Yeah. And sometimes he would be mean to me. <laughs> in, in a little way. He, you know, I would make a suggestion. He would go <laughs> like that. But, but it, it took a while. But it ended up in the book, nonetheless. Well, no, it, not not always. Not no. always. Ever so often, uh, he would uh, pay no attention to suggestions I made, and then those suggestions would be picked out in reviews as bad spots in the book. 
And that was so wonderful. <laughs> and my stock went up. Well, perhaps this is a, speaking of, of the, the length and, and what it's like to be both a wife and a collaborator, there's a wonderful Henry James uh, story or novella, whatever you'd call it, called The Lesson of the Master, where two young people are talking about a great writer and his wife. And it was said that the, the wife of the great writer, quote, didn't care for perfection. And the younger writer said, that's a great crime in an artist's life, in an artist's wife, that it was a terrible thing. What do you think of that? Of perfectionism in, in the writing? She, she, don't get her started on this. <laughs> well, I, I don't have a... a no, I don't have anything I'm the, against I'm the one perfection. With, I'm the one with the perfectionism problem. That's been a... a but, my, but the question had to do with how I felt about that. And yeah. I, I don't... I, I, I think... I don't think it's not perfectionist to move things along. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it's... It's you have to be imperfect. I would put it a little differently. I mean, there, there, I have a tendency to uh, include a kind of didactic element in my in my stories and in my, in my uh, sorry in my novels, and um, it can get it can get uh, excessive. It can get it can get out of control, and it's the kind of writing that would be appropriate in a different setting. But. And century, <laughs> but um, I love it, so I have to. We have to. We have to re reach an accommodation on that. A simple thing to say about this is that Norman, everything. I think that um, this is making me sound critical, and I'm so uncritical that for that I actually often save notes he's written that are like on grocery lists, little things, because I think there's, I just like the way he says things. So I really love his writing, but he does like to, to think about thinking. And, and I may be interested in his thoughts about thinking, but if there's a novel and there's an awful lot of the author thinking about thinking or of the, the the narrator thinking about thinking, people are going to skim. And then you should put in the beginning, uh, prepare to skim one third of this novel. Or, or I, I, can give you, I can give an example of, of, of something that I, I still think is terrific, but is a kind of example of a sort of madness. I wrote a, a novel before I got fully into my ex experimental uh, exploits. I wrote a novel about a novella, it should be, a novel about a cocktail party at which a representative of every sect of the American left is present and arguing with one another. <laughs> Everyone, including the only follower of a man named Bordiga in the United States. He had one follower, and he was present at this party, along with the Trotskyites and the De, uh, uh, De Leonis and the anarchists and so on. Now, I think that's great fun, but my interests are a little unusual. <laughs> but what you forgot to say is that you had written something else before that, and I said, Norman, I really think these are very interesting, this, and this is true, I'm, I'm not making myself sound sort of softer, I really was sorry for him. And I said, I think these are really interesting. But you really feel hurt when rejection slips come. And if you don't want to get rejection slips like fall foliage, you really have to pay attention to what other people are interested in, not just what you're interested in, in which I find interesting because I find your mind interesting. And so you said, I understand what you mean, and I am going to think about things in that way, and I'm going to write things that are interesting to and appealing to and accessible 
in a much wider way. And that this story, your novella you're just describing, is what you produced. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> But no, but the collaboration has worked. You've inspired him. So many of the women in, in Norman's stories and novels have the ring of your voice and your sensibility. So I think it's, it's, it's all together worked. Now, I could go on asking you about this forever, but I should open up to the audience. So um, there are people with microphones, so please raise your hands if you have a question. No, you should stay. Questions for Elsa or for Norman. Um, I see a question back there. Is that Claudia? Do you have a question, Claudia? <laughs> Claudia is the organizer of all the public um, events here at the Hammer, and she does a beautiful job. I was hoping to go incognito, but I was, this is a question for Norman, and I'm wondering if you've ever considered publishing the long play versions for the few who would love reading about the radicals at the dinner party. Oh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't want to open the issue again. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, like, uh, maybe, I, I doubt it. I doubt it. I doubt that I have other, I have other projects that, uh, that are crowding the field, the time, you know, that's available for this kind of thing, and I'm not sure that that would be the best, the best use of my um, creative spirit. I don't think so, probably. Yes, yeah, so there's a question over here. So Mark Sarvers. Hi. Actually, I have one question for each, if that's okay. Yes, please. Um, I just want to touch back on something that Elsa just said, where you framed uh, your, your advice to, to Norman in the context of how rejection hurts him. I'm here with my Novel 3 students, and I always tell them, in essence, write the thing you're passionate about and don't think about in the audience. If he were more impervious to rejection, would you advise him differently? Only if he were also impervious to dire poverty. <laughs> I was a hand weaver and designer. Pick up your, your, your mic. Oh, I, I was a I was a hand weaver and designer. I had when we lived in the city. I had been designing for power looms and for a place called Bernati Limited, which is no longer exists. A, a design studio. Uh, we when our son was five and ready for school, we moved to Rockland County. And um, uh, there was not a lot of work that paid very well, and I had a child. So, so I had, in our house, I started weaving, did, doing what's called art weaving, and I did a lot of rugs and uh, tapestries and many shawls, scarves, and whatever I could sell or show in galleries or museums. And that's a piecework, you know, you don't, we, we, it's very hard even though I think our rent was something like $55 a month at the time. There was no central heating and there was like a three foot deep well. It was, uh, we just had a wood stove. Uh, so there was a reason it was so cheap. Um, uh, uh, so really, he had to help too, and he was working as an antiquarian bookseller. So uh, people who have um, a trust fund can do whatever they want, but you really, uh, it's very difficult to, to have two people, who neither of whom is living in a place in which it's easy to make money. I, and we didn't have medical, any medical coverage until I got a, a job um, as the, the director of the preschool program for dependent and, and neglected children at a place called St. Agatha Home for Children in Rockland County. And uh, that was the first medical coverage we had. We were young, so actually we didn't give it much thought, uh, but now I would be thinking about it all the time if we didn't have any, any medical coverage. So, I don't know, people have to make a decision about it. If you don't, if you write, 
if you masturbate all the time, you're never going to have children. You just have to, <laughs> you know, that's the way it's going to be. <laughs> Thank you. Thank um, you. And, <laughs> um, the, the question I wanted to ask. Did you Norma, have a question? Another question? Yeah, for Norman. I was very interested in the Paris Review interview where you talked about this idea of making character dossiers. And I was wondering if you could maybe tell, uh, tell the students in particular a little bit more about how you go about that, what goes into a character dossier, how do you use it in the writing of the novel itself? Yeah, so the preliminary step in, uh, in writing a novel for me is to, is to produce a, basically a, a biographical study of the characters, the, the, the primary characters, and even some of the, even most of the secondary characters, that is, birth to the present, and, uh, and uh, make them very full, and the way I use them is uh, uh, kind of mysterious. I, I internalize the char I internalize what I know about the characters, so that when I begin to write, I know the histories and and parts of the history come to play a role. Um, and the way the lives intersect uh, arise out of the the writing of the uh, the, the dossiers. I, I should have saved my dossiers. I haven't saved them. Uh, now I will be saving them. Like people have yelled at me about it. But, uh, but that is the way I start the books. We have time for a few more questions. Yes, sir. Hello. First of all, thank, thank you both so much. It was a great reading. Um, I liked what you said, uh, Norman, in the beginning about um, what things that like propels your characters, what they complain about, things that bothers them. But um, I seem to see, see the connection between what bothers people is really what they care about the most, what they love. So I, I always try to think what propels characters, but trying to find a balance between that frustration and that love can, you know, it's much like relationships where you look into someone, you're trying to get everyone fr everything from them, but it's not really safe, you know? You uh -huh. never know what they're gonna do to you, so. Can you do you understand the difference, like the connection there, or do you just try not to understand it? Uh, say it uh, slightly <laughs> more plainly. Okay. Do you do you think you understand the connection between um, love and annoyance, love and what <laughs> bothers you? Because I I can't. Well, that would really be it. Understand the, the connection between love and annoyance. Well, I thought you said the difference between them. <laughs> what, whatever you think is closer. <laughs> well, the connection certainly makes sense. The difference seems weird. Yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not quite plain on what you're asking, but, but I, there, is a, there is a connection between um, the kinds of complaints that exist that are personal, purely personal, and a result of personal accident and complaints that uh, originate on a higher plane, like where you happen to be born, what time you happen to be born into, what the political matrix is in which you have to try to find your, uh, your sense of rightness and being. And um, those two things go together all the time in my work. Uh, the, uh, in a way, if you look at the political dimension of the, the two big novels and the short stories so far, um, you can see that there's a, an ongoing study of America as a kind of good empire, as it understands itself, at work in the world. And the relationship between, people, between what people think they're doing in Africa, what they're actually doing, and what the, the sovereign that sends them there and mostly supports them there is doing and thinks they're doing, those are all very complicated interrelated questions and I mean, you're saying that that your characters believe they're yeah uh, 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 representing america as a good empire yeah yes not that it but is a good it, empire but yeah. as that they're yeah. understanding at the, at, at, the, at its most sophisticated when it gets its most sophisticated people understand themselves in that connection but there's a a, de, a level beyond which empire is not good and uh, which acts are not good. And there are all kinds of roles to be played in the context of, of empire. Not a popular subject with American readerships. But 
Yeah, I think the, the biggest balance that it's important to maintain in writing books that, that have a serious intent is that between the, the purely personal kinds of uh, contestation and agonies that we go through and the larger framework that creates the framework in which we suffer and others suffer. I don't Can know I if say I... something else, too? Uh, I ha when you talk about uh, your pairing love and annoyance, uh, it, um, I just want to say that um, That of course everybody gets married. I mean, any, everyone who gets married or lives for a long time with someone gets annoyed at them. And you get annoyed at the person you sit next to at work if your desk is too close and you have to interact too much. But if you, and just very quickly about Norman and me, it, it, it love at first sight is foolish, but. Uh, sometimes the unconscious mind is clever, and as it happened when our families got together, and when I first went to his house, his house was full of lamps, towels, silverware patterns, p uh, pictures on the wall. Uh, his, his, his house and my parents' apartment had so many similar things in it, and our parents loved each other, and they were all socialists. I mean, even my FBI parents were socialists and atheists. Norman's parents had been atheists. They became some kind of nutty religious people, but they were still so <laughs> socialists. So, in, in other words, it, it, really, we were very familiar, and I think maybe an unconscious thing in my mind was saying sim similar, 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 something like that. But if you are with someone and you're really annoyed a lot with them, that doesn't sound too good. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you could be annoyed and then at the same time feel for them and love them. I don't know. We had a question over here. Um, I was wondering what this collaboration does for your love life. Like, Norman, when you're kind of, you know, developing your characters, a lot of whom, as I understand it, kind of assume Elsa's qualities. Do you, do you just, like, fall more in love with her? And I don't know, I, this is so romantic of me, but, like, I really want to know, like, what it does for, you know, your love life. If it just kind of keeps it spicy, I don't know. <laughs> Well, I have to say, I, I'm, I'm really, um, I'm overwhelmed with gratitude toward Elsa for her, the, the literary quarry that she's turned out to be for me. That's foremost in my mind. Um, uh, but uh, we've always been good friends that way, and, uh, and uh, it, it has, uh, it's made me conscious of um, uh, the treasure that I have, and I, and I, continue to write down things that she said, and uh, they strike uh, fire in my mind. And some of them will appear in the next book, I will say. We've been married for 55 years. We've been married for 55 years, and um, in the very beginning, we, we had this little idea about free love. And uh, after a very brief period, when Norman realized that I didn't understand that to just mean he was to have free love, <laughs> he, I caught him up with, up with him so fast. And uh, because, I mean, you know, so, so easy. And. Uh, <laughs> And it, very quickly, in really the first uh, two or three years, Norman said, "I, you know what all this is? This is we could call this the dance of the soon-to-be-parted." 
And we figured out, in fact, we saw it happen all over, that everybody who, with a couple of exceptions, some of whom you know, uh, uh, did the dance of the soon to be parted and were never parted. But, but it, it, it is dangerous if you, uh, if, uh, uh, if you don't uh, find your monogamous life happy and satisfying. We had a few questions from two gentlemen up here. I'm curious, uh, who are your favorite uh, writers of the, let's say, 20th, limiting it to the 20th century? And what, briefly, favorite writers and why? Yeah, well, the, uh, the, the two that, uh, that, that are, are predominant, I'd, I'd have to, I wouldn't be answering truly if I didn't go back to Dostoevsky and the great Russians, uh, always a burning sort of monument of of what to achieve with, with letters. Uh, and uh, uh, coming further into the, into the 20th century, I've already mentioned Joyce and uh, Conrad. Conrad, because I, th I found to be a supreme master at combining the, what we were talking about, the political uh, kind of fate that imposes itself on people who, whose intentions are uh, not necessarily to suffer or to dominate. Um, Malcolm Lowry's Under the Volcano, I think, although it's been called a premeditated classic, I still think is a sort of classic in, in somewhat the same ways. Um, uh, Chekhov, uh, the great Russian masters and the great realists of the, of the, of the late 19th century are, uh, are the... Uh, the models that I think about. Yes. I'm curious, what do you think about the other Norman of the 20th century, Mailer? Well, I, I think an interesting writer, a great talent, uh, sort of bedeviled by foolish ideological choices. Um, I think he's, he made him f sort of a fool of himself, ultimately, with his, uh, with his intellectual attachments to uh, sort of overblown Laurentian tropes about human life, things that were patently untrue, although fun to talk about. We have time for a few more questions, and I see two in the, sort of in the back row. There's a fellow in an orange shirt and a fellow... Why is this, why is this side of the crowd so much more inquisitive? This side, <laughs> they're ruining everything. We're going to have to give you a gist. I, uh, That's a quote from, from one of the, the funniest, uh, uh, one of the great comics of our time. One of the great comics of our time, Paula Poundstone, when she, she tell the, uh, the plane is going over the, the Grand Canyon and he, the pilot says, if you look out on the left hand side of the plane, plane you can see the Grand Canyon. And, and she's a passenger and she, she looks around and she says, yeah. And she says, look, they're looking, they're ruining everything. <laughs> so, so ahead, sorry. What was the question? Uh, you, had, you had mentioned earlier when you referenced Uncle Tom's Cabin, um, sort of the role that literature plays outside of the artistic mm -hmm. sphere. Yeah. Um, I just want to know what your thoughts are about how that's also happening in, through your own writing today or just in modern writing in general. Well. I have no have no idea. I, I th think that the ambition to do that is uh, is not as widespread as it might once have been. I mean, that is the, the idea or the feeling of of a literary artist that he wants to sum up the situation of his time. Um, you know, that's you're going back to Eliot and George Eliot and. Uh, uh, a lot of, a lot of the the visions that that went with being a being a literary artist in those times. It's a smaller thing now. I, they, somebody said something about me and globalism, and I think there's some truth to that. Uh, me and globalism, writing about about globalization, uh, because I, my stuff was set overseas mostly, not not like this one. Um, 
I, I don't know. I don't. I don't really know what to say about that. I think. I think literature is in trouble in is beleaguered from so many directions that uh, that I'm not sure that uh, that people can in this time rise up, sit at their desk with the same ambition to create a kind of emblematic and summary statement that catches a lot of the, the spirit of the time. I don't know. I think it's very tough. It's a tough sell. Yeah. That's, that's the, the young lady there, and then let's go to Charlie. Um, hello. You Hi. mentioned that you struggled with a sense of perfectionism yes. while mm -hmm. working, and I can imagine that's very frustrating when you're trying to complete a work. How do you find yourself with a sense that you that you can move forward, that you've finished what you've set out to write? Well, <laughs> I've. Uh I don't know. It's just a perpetual struggle. Uh, it, you need somebody to point it out to you, and you uh, and you. It's 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 an it's an ongoing it's an ongoing uh, contention within your spirit. Uh, I I I think I'd have gotten in in terrible trouble if I had uh, combined my experimental uh, ambitions with my. My perfectionism, much worse, it, that phase of my life would have lasted much longer than it did. But I had a, a very uh, proactive muse. And <laughs> as far as I can, that, that's really what I have to, to attribute it to. Find someone who, who, who sees you doing it and tells you to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have time for one last question and then... Um well, Norman has agreed to sign books upstairs in the bookstore, either books you've brought. So, I don't know. Let's take you in the middle. Go ahead. Just shout it out. Just wanted to know um, what drew you to the topic of friendship this time around? Uh, life. <laughs> and there was also a kind of symmetry in the... Uh, in the books that I've been writing, the, as Mona said, the first is a, was a sort of a study of courtship, the second is a study of marriage, and the, this one is a, a study of friendship, especially male friendship. And if, what I realized as I look back over the, the generations of writers, there's almost nothing um, of a major nature about male friendship. And it was thinking about friendship in, and its role in my life uh, and failures of friendship, of course, going with that. That just led me into a, a I guess partly getting older too, uh, into a deeper um, desire to understand it in a deep way. And that's, where, that's really where it came from. Thank you so much. Um,